So how many of you know we've been in this series for a little while now? Somebody said, amen, like, can we just get on with it? <laughs> well, good news for you is this is the last one. Uh, we're finishing up our series on the Lord's Prayer today. Eight weeks counting today that we've been in this passage. And um, I, I just want to say this right now. I want to say this right now. If you get, hear me, I, I'm serious. There should be a lot of encouragement in today's message. But if you feel yourself starting to get offended in any kind of way, okay? If you feel yourself starting to move in a, in a, in a negative attitude direction, maybe the Holy Spirit's speaking to you, okay? So instead of getting angry, let's keep our ears in tune with the Spirit of God. Maybe He's revealing something to us. How many of you know that? How many of you know that the Word of God will do that to us? Sometimes He will come and, and cut away things that we don't need. You know what I'm talking about? So there's a lot of encouragement here, but I believe the Lord's going to convict many of us in the room today as well. So if you'd stand with me one more time. If you're new here today, we just stand in honor of the reading of the opening passage of Scripture. It's the Word of God. And uh, so we just honor that. So if you want a title for today, it's Deliver Us. We're going to read for the final time in this series, Matthew 6, 9-13, through which is the Lord's Prayer. And it says, Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be Your name. Your kingdom come and Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we've also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We pray right now in the name of Jesus. I pray in Jesus' name that there would be nothing that would be a backlash or a retribution for what's going to be declared today. We say no in Jesus' name to any demonic assignment that would try to cause people to be distracted this morning. Lord, let today be a day of liberation and freedom for God's people. And for those that maybe don't know You, I pray that today would be the day that the bonds of sin are broken off of them and they are made free indeed through the name and the power of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank You for Your Word. Speak to us through it today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. So that last part of the Lord's Prayer, deliver us from evil. It means a couple of things. It's a literal definition, deliver us from evil. So deliver us from evil. Pretty simple. But that also, that word evil can be translated to say, deliver us from the evil one. Okay, so deliver us from evil means literally deliver us from evil, but it also means deliver us from the evil one. So, how many of you know that we are in a spiritual battle? How many of you know that spiritual warfare, no matter how crazy you think it is, or how kooky you think intercessors are in their prayer, spiritual warfare is a real thing? And we face a spiritual battle every single day. I believe there are too many Christians that walk around with a very ignorant mindset as it pertains to spiritual warfare. Ignorant doesn't mean you're dumb. Ignorant means you just don't know any better. Ignorant means unlearned. You haven't been taught. You haven't received it in some kind of way. But let me tell you today that we are in a spiritual fight. That there is an enemy of your soul. And I'm not saying this to stir up fear. It's just reality. Oh, well, preacher, you're starting us off with a pretty rough uh, 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 statement there that there's an enemy that's out there to get me. Friends, the Bible tells us that. 1 Peter 5.8 says that we should be sober-minded. That we should be alert. Why? We should be watchful. Because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. That is the approach, the thought process of the enemy of your soul. Why do you think we push spiritual principles so much in this church, and hopefully in many churches? We're not perfect, but we push. Follow after the Word of God. Pursue intimate relationship with God. Because, friends, there is an enemy of your soul. Do not be deceived. Do not be confused. There is an enemy who's out to get you. Where's the encouragement? It's coming, I promise. It will be here. Hang in there. But we have to realize this. There is an enemy of your soul. And if that's true, then there are some important truths that we need to stand on. If we know that there's an enemy of our soul, 
then there are some biblical truths that we must stand on. And the first one is this. Jesus has power over the enemy. Jesus has power over him. Now look, I'm just going to say this now. I'm planning for this to be a shorter message because the prayer time is going to take a minute. We're going to go through a prayer model of the Lord's Prayer when this thing's over. We're going to walk through it step by step and we're going to pray together. All right? So if you feel like the message is short, don't think you're getting out early because we're probably going to pray for a little bit. But Jesus has power over the enemy. Let me break down, because I've heard people talk. They maybe don't say these words exactly, but the way they talk sounds like they believe this. But let me break this for you because it's not true. The cross was not Jesus' submission to the devil. Jesus did not endure the cross because the devil made Him. Are you, are you grabbing that? I cannot stand this Americanized, modernized, sissified Jesus who has to be meek and mild and, 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 and wussy Jesus who doesn't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Is He meek and mild? Yes, but the word meek means power under control. You want to know what Jesus' meekness is? He has the power to destroy anything and everything that He wants to, but He chooses not to because He loves you. Amen. He loves me. Jesus, uh, uh, going through the cross... Enduring the crucifixion was His atonement for the sins of the world. Jesus, He's talking about His upcoming crucifixion in John 14. Listen to what Jesus says in verses 30 and 31. He says, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He's talking about the devil, correct? But look what He says. He has no claim on me. You see that? The devil, Jesus saying, the devil has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. Jesus, in His own words, He says, the devil has no claim on me. He has no power over me. And I think it's important for us to, to grasp the truth of this. And I know many of us know this, but I really want us to chew on it this morning that Jesus chose to endure the cross. No one made Him do it. The Roman soldiers did not make Jesus go to the cross. The Jewish leaders of that day did not force Jesus to be crucified. Satan himself did not make Jesus endure the cross. Jesus chose to endure the cross because of His love for the Father and His love for us. Friends, Jesus has all power over the devil. You all need to wake up this morning. That's some exciting stuff. Jesus has all power over Satan. Period. End of story. No other discussion can be had. The enemy has never had, nor will he ever have, power over Jesus. In 1 John 3 and verse 8, it's talking about the practice of sinning when it comes to us. But look at the truth that we find there. It says, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. But why did Jesus come? It says the reason the Son of God appeared was to do what? Destroy the works of the devil. Why did Jesus come? Why did Jesus endure the cross? Because He took every single bit of power that Satan even thought about possessing and tore it apart through the cross Amen. and through His resurrection. Friends, Satan has no power over Jesus. The whole point of Jesus enduring the cross was to defeat the works of the devil. Does the Scripture not tell us in Philippians 2.10 that every knee in heaven, on earth, and under earth is going to have to bow at the name of Jesus? Does the Scripture not tell us in Colossians 2.15 that Jesus disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities and He put them all to shame by His victory over them at the cross? Friends, I'm talking about Jesus came. He showed up to the devil's house. He took all His weapons kicked his butt up one side and down the other of that house and left. That's the God we serve. Not some sissy Jesus that lets you do whatever you want to do. No, Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. He came to deliver us. He came to deliver you. Even in the stuff you're in right now, you're walking in relationship with Jesus. He came to deliver you from the demonic nonsense that's in your life right now. The things you're watching on TV, the things you're listening to. My mama and all the kids' church teachers I had when I was a kid, they taught me garbage in, garbage out. 
So pay attention to what you let into your eye gates and your ear gates. You're watching sorcery on your movies and in your books and you're acting like it's all fun and games. You're playing games with the devil. Be careful. Yeah, I'm going to go there today. You like your Harry Potter books. Be careful. Listen, we used to be into the Marvel movie stuff and so they started letting demons in on there and we quit watching it. Be careful. Friends, pay attention. Yo, well, I don't know what's of God and what's not. Pray! Ask Him. And you know what I found out? When I ask God, hey, should I do this or not? He'll tell me. And then I just obey. Or at least I try to. I'm not perfect. Anybody else not perfect in here? <laughs> Who's not perfect? Can I get an amen? Yeah, me too. I'm, I'm not either. But as best as I'm able to, right, I ask the Holy Spirit. I'll say, Lord, speak to me. Should I or should I not partake in this? People playing around with Ouija boards. What are you doing? You're talking to demons, people. Be careful. Be smart. Listen, it... If we have a, an enemy who prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, why are you trying to crack the door open for him? And many people in the church do that stuff and they don't even realize it. Because we walk around in ignorance. We're not even paying attention to the traps that we're walking directly into. Friends, be careful. But understand in the middle of that, even if you have opened doors like that in your life, I'll go there, pornography. You're letting demons into your house by watching that stuff. I'll even go a step further. A lot of the people who are in that industry don't even want to be. Human trafficking, people are making money off of your flesh and abusing people off of your flesh. Friends, I'm telling you. And look, I'm not beating down on anybody. So I, there's stuff that I'm talking about this morning that, that I've had to deal with in my own life. All right? So I'm not trying to say, oh, well, I've never dealt with anything, any of these things. No, I'm just saying we need to walk in the Spirit every day. And as we do, the desires of the flesh will be crucified at the cross of Christ. Friends, we've got to be careful the doors that we're opening up to the enemy. And don't be naive. When we open ourselves to sin, we are opening doors to demonic things to happen around us. It's awful quiet in here. I knew that would be the case today. And that's, that's okay. That's okay. I knew this was going to be a quiet message. You'd get excited about the Jesus having power thing. You'll get excited about something I'm getting ready to tell you in a minute. But when we're confronted with sin, nobody's happy about it. We did it a little bit last week, but I'm going a little step deeper. Now I'm not just talking about don't do the bad things, right? Because you can only not do the bad things or be a good boy or a good girl through the guidance and the help of the Holy Spirit. You don't have that power on your own. We talked about that last week. Now what I'm talking about today is when you open the door with sin, you're opening yourself up to more than just, I did a bad thing. You're opening yourself up to demonic attacks. And we need to be careful. Now, how many of you want some good news? Yeah, You, you, you like this one? If it ain't, listen, at least somebody's here, right? Matthew 28, it's a great commission. I've mentioned this passage several times. But in 18 through 20, Jesus in the Great Commission, look at what He says. Before He even commissions them to go, He establishes who's in charge. He says to the disciples, all authority, look at your neighbor and say all of it. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So who has all the power? Jesus. And he says, from that place of authority, he says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. So Jesus, in all of His power, all of His authority, He commands us. It's the great commission, not the great suggestion. God is commanding us to reach the lost world with the message of the gospel. Correct. Correct. Now, if we are commissioned with that, we must understand that in that process, the enemy of your soul will try to trip you up and cause you to deter from the path that God has for you to walk. Can we agree with that? Yes. Now, so if all of that is true, I want to encourage you that, yes, my first point was that Jesus has power over the enemy. My second point is this, Jesus enables us to overcome. How many of you are excited about that? He enables you to overcome. So what are some things that we need to do to walk out what Jesus has already empowered us to do? See, here's the thing. The power to overcome has already been given to you. 
Power, hear me, power over demonic spirits has already been put in you. Listen to what Scripture says. Holy Spirit, same power that raised Jesus from the dead, lives in us as children of God. You know what I'm saying? Are you with me on that? Now I will say this. Seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's another message for another day. I'd be here preaching for two weeks. But seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You don't know what that is? The Scriptures tell us it's an empowerment from on high. Jesus said that in Luke 24, 49. He says, I'm leaving. Don't go anywhere. Don't do anything until you've been clothed with power from on high. The disciples are obedient to that. They go into Jerusalem. They pray. And then you see Acts chapter 2 where they're baptized in the Holy Spirit. The physical evidence that they've been baptized in the Holy Spirit is they do what? They speak in tongues. You think it's weird? I think it's biblical. Now let me get back on the wagon here. What are the things we need to do? How do we need to walk it out? I think Ephesians 6 gives us some pretty good points. I'm going to read Ephesians 6, 11 through the beginning of verse 18. Many of you know what's here. It's talking about the armor of God. It says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, authorities, and cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Friends, don't tell me there's not a spiritual battle. It's right there. We're told to wear armor because we're in a battle. And we're going to read about it. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, put on the breastplate of righteousness, as your sho- and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. And in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, this thing right here, Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. So what do we need to do? So if Jesus has given us power to overcome, He has delivered us and He's made us people of deliverance, what does that mean? The first thing is it means is this. Stand in the full armor of God. That's what you need to do. You stand in the full armor of God. Not missing any piece of it. So a quick rundown again. We need to have our armor held together with the belt of truth. What is truth? Is Jesus. Do we stand in the truth of Jesus? Do we stand in the truth of who He is? You have the breastplate of righteousness. What protects everything that's right here? The breastplate of righteousness. What is that breastplate? I've said it five times already, I feel like. It's a righteous life. The righteousness of Christ. As He changes who you are, you're covered by it. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, we walk in God's peace with our shoes, no matter what brand they are. It's an inside joke for some people that are catching that. Mm -hmm. I'm in I'm in the Jesus shoes, that's all I care about. He gave me shoes, He gave me shoes of peace. In all circumstances, here's one, here's one I want you to grab a hold of, okay? Now, we need to grab a hold of all of them. But listen to what this says. In all circumstances, so in, in what circumstances do we take up the shield of faith? All of them. Now, look at the promise that we're given when we do. So, in all circumstances, we take up the shield of faith with which, the shield of faith, we can extinguish all... All, say it again, all the flaming darts of the evil one. So everything that the enemy shoots at you, as long as you are equipped with and know how to use the shield of faith, he cannot touch you. The helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Using the offensive, I talked about it a little bit last week, I'm going to touch on it again today. The offensive weapon in the armor of God. Know how to use it, friend. Know how to use it. And don't just know how to use it because you, oh, this somebody else talked about it. I'm going to finish the message with a similar story and I'll show you what happened when somebody said, you know, this Jesus that somebody else talked about. No, you need to know Him for yourself. 
And the only way you can do it is by knowing this. I said it last week, I'll say it again today. John 1 tells us, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So Jesus is right here. The Word of God. This is Jesus. You want to know Jesus, know His Word. It was a little more quiet on that than it should have been. But we need to stand in the full armor of God. The second thing that we need to do, not only do we need to stand in the full armor of God, we need to pray. It is amazing to me, and I can say this because I've been guilty of it in my own life, but it's amazing to me how, how much the American church lacks prayer. Let me, let me say this to you. When we don't pray, there is no communication between us and God. Yes, we can hear from Him through His Word, but the truth of the matter is when we're reading the Word with the right heart, it's a prayerful reading. Are, are you picking that up? Like when we're reading, Lord, speak to me, you're praying and reading at the same time. It's not just like I picked up some random book and I'm like, oh, I'm going to read it and then I'm going to close it. And like it says in James, you look at yourself in the mirror and then when you step away, you already forget what you look like. No, I'm reading it with a prayerful heart. Friends, we need to pray. There needs to be a revival of prayer in this church and in the American church overall. Friends, we, we call ourselves Christians and we don't talk to God. Do you not see the problem there? And oh, well, I go to church on Sunday. Well, good for you. When you stand before God one day, He's going to say, what would you do with the other six days of the week? Friends, here's what I found out. Relationships are everyday things. Real, deep, intimate relationships are everyday things. I can't just look at Morgan and be like, you're not my wife today. <laughs> now, some days she would probably be okay with that. Because I've acted a certain kind of way. And she's like, whoa, like, <laughs> not really. Obviously, I'm kidding, but I can't hear me. I can't pick and choose based on my mood or how I'm feeling or how upset I am because she didn't do what I wanted her to do. I can't say, oh, well, I don't want to communicate in that relationship. No, friends. How many of you have ever been in a place where God didn't do something that you wanted Him to do? Listen, I'm way off my notes now. How many of you have ever been in a place where God didn't do what you wanted Him to do? How many of you, listen, don't raise your hand, but consider this for a moment. How many of us in those moments have acted just the way that I described? God, you didn't do what I want to do, so I'm going to give you the silent treatment. The book of Isaiah says this, says, As the heavens are above the earth, so are His ways above our ways, and His thoughts above our thoughts. You want to know what that tells me? God knows more than me. How many of you are grateful for those times where you wanted something to happen and it didn't happen? And God did something better? He put you in a better place, a better relationship, a better whatever? Friends, I'm here to tell you. Whew. I'm grateful for that. But you know what that is? That comes through relationship. And when I talk to God, I've learned I can trust Him. But that trust and relationship only comes from cultivating the relationship. And how do we cultivate relationship with God? We talk with Him. He speaks to us. We speak to Him. What does the Scripture say? It tells us that we are to pray without ceasing. There's an open line of communication between me and God all the time. I speak with Him and He listens. He speaks with me and I listen. That's relationship. So friends, we need to wear the full armor of God, stand in it. We need to pray. And I'm not just talking about your bedtime and your meal prayers. I'm talking about praying with fervor and urgency. There are some of us that we are so caught in our ritualistic prayers that we don't even remember if we prayed or not. I pray the same prayer every night. Are you touching heaven or are you just ticking it off your sheet so you can act spiritual? How many of you have ever talked to somebody who's distracted before? This is guilty as charged. I'm, so, I, I'm just talking about myself. I've been that way multiple times. People will be talking to me directly and I won't hear a word of it. I cannot be the only one in this room, but that's the case. Come on. Listen, if you, if it, listen wives, if it's your husband, don't you dare. Call him out or point at him or anything else. Because that's probably a common thread here, I understand. How many of us treat our relationship with God like that? 
He begins to speak to us and we're the distracted one. How many times have we missed hearing from God because we've been distracted? Friends, I'm here to tell you, intimacy is what I'm talking about when I say pray. Not just we're talking at God. We're communicating with Him. He speaks and we listen. Our hearts are open. When He corrects us, we receive it even when our flesh doesn't want to. Some of you even here today that as the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart, I called out some books and some movies and some different things, and the Lord's speaking to you saying, hey, maybe you shouldn't be dabbling around with this stuff. You can get mad at me all you want. I really don't care. I love you. You can be angry with me, and that's between you and God to sort out. I'm just going to tell you the truth. But what I want you to do is take those things to the Lord. If you're feeling a little worked up, why don't you just pray about it? See what the Holy Spirit has to say. And then take what He has to say over me any day. Okay? Pastor Aaron's not Jesus. So you pray. And whatever the Holy Spirit tells you to do, you do what the Holy Spirit says. Alright? But we need to be people of prayer. He's given us the ability to overcome when we stand in His armor, when we pray. And my last piece of that is we need to know the real enemy. That's my third part. Know the real enemy. I'm so sick. My whole life, my whole life, I'm 36 years old. I've been in the church my whole life. I'm so sick and tired of people in the church that cannot get along. It drives me nuts. I can't stand it because it's demonic. The root cause of division in the church is always demonic because God is not the author of confusion. And it normally comes through innocent means. Not always. Sometimes it's, it's malicious. But more often than not, it's innocent means. Somebody will say something they didn't even know was dumb. They'll say something that was offensive and didn't even realize they offended you. And they go about their life like nothing happened because in their mind, nothing happened. And then somebody grabs a hold of it and the next thing you know, it's like World War III in the church. I cannot stand. I can't stand when people in the church start to butt heads. I grew, the church I grew up in split and it closed for a while because of that stuff. So this is very near and dear to my heart. We need to know who the enemy is and it's not the person sitting in the row three, you know, three rows behind you. That's not that person sitting on the opposite corner of the church. We are in the family of God. And you know what I found out about brothers and sisters? Sometimes they don't get along. How many of you here have siblings? You know what I'm talking about. I have family that I don't get along with. I'm a middle child. I have an older and a younger sister. And, and, and what I will describe it as is my sisters and I had moments of intense fellowship where we argued. I mean, I could tell you some stories I'm not proud of. Of disagreements that I had with my sisters. But you know what I found out? Even in those moments of disagreement, if I was able to look past the disagreement, I still love my sisters. And you know what I found out about those disagreements? I was able to work through them. And we were able to get through that stuff together because we were family. You know what I mean? It's important to realize that we are family. And I'm going to extend that. I'm not just talking about in-house. I also can't stand when people from various churches argue with each other. Equally as stupid. It drives me nuts. How are we leading the world to Jesus when we bicker with other people who are supposed to be in our family? Oh, why don't you come to our church? It's better than that church. If I was somebody who heard something like that, I'd be like, I think you both stink. (laughs) Because neither one of you looking like Jesus by the way you're treating each other. These are some real issues in a church. Dare I even say there may be some real issues like this in our church. Friends, we need to know who the real enemy is. Our passage, and you don't have to pull it back up, it's fine, I'll just read it. But Ephesians 6, what did it tell us? It said in verse 12, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. In the New Era translation, that means we're not fighting with each other. I'm not fighting with you. You're not fighting with me. That's not what this is about. You and I might disagree on something right now, but my real fight's not with you at all. The Scripture tells me that we already read... My fight is against the rulers. It's against the authorities. It's against the cosmic powers over this present darkness. It's against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. My fight's not with you. The way this is supposed to work is we stand together and push back darkness. 
And as we know who our real enemy is, we stand in the armor of God, we pray, and we know that our real enemy is not the people who are around us, but it's against demonic strongholds. When we know who the real enemy is, we have a choice to make. And that choice is shown to us in James chapter 4. We submit ourselves to God. We resist the devil. And he will flee from you. Verse 8 says that we draw near to God and He will draw near to you. And then cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. In that whole passage, James is telling him, if you started in verse 1, he's calling out a lot of their issues. You do this, really, that's not the way it should be. On and on he goes. He says, this is what you need to do. You need to submit yourself to God, resist the devil, he'll flee from you. And then basically he finishes verse 8 by saying, repent. All your double-mindedness, all this stuff where you're this way and that way and here and there and everywhere, you're divided. No, what you need to do is repent. So my question this morning, I'm, I'm almost closing here. Does your life reflect that you stand firm in the power of God? That you stand firm in His armor? Does your life reflect that you are a man or a woman of prayer, of intimate relationship with God? Does your life reflect that you are a person who knows who the real enemy is? Even when somebody in the church is driving you crazy, i got news for you. If you haven't been in a church very long, that will happen at some point. Because the church is full of people and none of us are perfect. You're going to get on somebody else's nerves and somebody else is going to get on yours. That's not me trying to quote a curse. It's just a fact. If you're in the church very long, somebody's going to bug you. They're going to say something wrong. Whether they meant to or not, it's going to happen. They're going to make a decision that you disagree with. On and on I can go. But this is the point. Even in those moments, we're still family and our fight is not with each other. Does your life reflect that you know who the real enemy is? And does your life reflect that you know how to resist the devil? I'm going to give you one more thought about this before we pray. Because I see a lot of people get beat up I see a lot of people get beat up spiritually because they try to piggyback off of the anointing of someone else. Oh, I go to this church, so that means we can... I listen to this particular uh, famous YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram preacher. I follow them so I can do what they do. I'm, in, I'm, a, I'm a friend of this person who's a, a Holy Ghost filled man or woman and because they do this, I can do this. I can be an overcomer because they are an overcomer. There is truth in those statements. Yes, God can use you in those ways. But friends, it's all about relationship with God first. You can't just say, oh, because these biblical principles are true, I'm just going to do it. No, apart from the relationship, you can't. Without intimacy with God, you don't have the power. What are you talking about? Well, Acts chapter 19, 13 through 16, it says, There were some itinerant Jewish exorcists, these people casting out demons, okay? They undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. And this is how they would try to cast devils out. They said, I adjure you by the name of Jesus who Paul proclaims. So let's stop there just for a second. These people, the Scripture calls them the seven sons of Sceva, they stand there and they say, we're going to cast these demons out, and the way we're going to do it, you know that Jesus that Paul talks about? You have to come out by the name of that Jesus that Paul talks about. And it says that in verse 14, it was the seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva who were doing this. But listen to the evil spirit and what the evil spirit said back. The evil spirit says back to them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And look why this is, and you better catch this. Because if you leave this place thinking, oh, I'm just going to cast out devils and I can walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and I can do all this kind of stuff, apart from relationship and intimacy with God, you're setting yourself up for a world of heartache. Look at what happened to them. It says, the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, overpowered them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Let me put this in, in more simple terms. That demon whipped them and sent them out the door butt naked. 
Get mad. It says, I, I added the word but, but it says naked right there. <laughs> if you're offended by that, I'm sorry. I apologize, okay? We needed some levity to this moment. That's good. It was accidental, but here we are. <laughs> Hear me now. Why did that happen? Those seven sons of Sceva didn't know Jesus like Paul did. But they were trying to piggyback off of what they saw Paul do. But it wasn't, hear me, it wasn't the methods that Paul used. It was the authority in Paul's life because of his relationship with God. When we say that deliver us in, the, in, a, in our main passage, the Lord's Prayer, deliver us from evil. There's an eternal statement there, yes, that Jesus has delivered us. That's already taken place. As we are children of God, we've already prayed that. So why are we still praying deliver us from evil? Because we live in an evil world. Because there is still an enemy of our souls. And friends, I'm here to tell you right now, all of us in some ways and sometimes we still need deliverance. Do you understand that? I don't care how close you are to Jesus, sometimes we still need deliverance. And I want to say this again because I want it to be clear. I'm getting ready to pray. I promise this already went longer than I thought it would. Too many soapboxes. If you don't know Jesus personally, you can't claim any of the promises in His Word. You can't. You have no power to overcome. You have no authority to bind and loose in any way apart from knowing Him. It's all about proximity. I'm not saying if you're a good boy or you're a good girl, Jesus is going to be proud of you and He's going to give you power to do all this stuff. No, what I'm saying is, is as you are in relationship with God, as you are in close proximity with Him, Every day, He knows you're not going to be perfect, but as you walk in close relationship with Him every day, that is where the power to overcome demonic spirits comes from. That's where it comes from. The process is simple. And James 4 told us, if we wouldn't mind to put James 4, 7 back on the screen. Here's your, here's your pattern. You ready? How can I get to the point where I can resist the devil and make him run away? It's the first part. Submit yourself to God. It's as simple as that. How many of you... I'm not saying don't be dumb. Let, let me say this because I think this is also important. Don't be dumb. What do I mean by that? Don't pray. Bring it on demonic spirits. I want Don't pray stupid prayers. We face enough issues on our own. Life has enough cares all on its own. Don't pray devil bring it on kind of prayers. That's just stupid. Don't do it. But... I can walk in confidence because of what's said here. If I submit myself to God, then I have all the power that I need to resist the devil and make him flee. Isn't that awesome? And the same can be true for you and for every single person in here. As we walk in relationship with God, Jesus has the power to overcome. He's given us the ability to overcome. So let's walk in it. Amen? Stand with me. We're going to go through a little prayer model here together. There's no music, no any of that. I'm going to give some prompts and we're going to kind of walk through this thing together. The truth of the matter is, the Lord's Prayer is a prayer of deliverance. The Lord's Prayer is a prayer of freedom. Think about all the things that we're asked, we're asking of God, or the things that we say. We focus on His power. We declare Him as our provider. We say that He's the only one who can forgive us. He gives us the help to forgive others. He is the shepherd of our lives. And, that, and, and we have faith that He can deliver us from the enemy of our souls. The whole Lord's Prayer is a prayer of deliverance from being self-centered, from being greedy, from being unforgiving, from being bound by sin, and, by, and having issues with evil in and of itself. So what we're going to do... and, and Whoever's working the slides back there, we're going to walk through the Lord's Prayer. It's going to take a little bit of time. So as soon as I finish reading what's on the screen, I might stay there a minute. All right? But we're going to start right now. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. You're not going to look around. Before I even jump into this, what I'm going to ask you to do is participate. Participate. Because I believe right now, I'm going to, I'm going to pray before I pray. That sounds goofy, but I'm going to do it. In Jesus' name, every lie of the devil has to shut up. 
Get out of this place. Be quiet. You have no authority in this room. You're not welcome. You have to go. I pray every hindering spirit, shut up and leave in the name of Jesus. We command any sort of retaliation for what's getting ready to happen in these prayers to try to come against the freedom that's about to be released in God's people's lives. Any retaliation, we say, no, you have no place in authority. You are not welcome in Jesus' name. We throw you out. We throw you out completely. You have no authority. Stay out in Jesus' name. But we're going to go through the Lord's Prayer. As I go through it, I'll give you a little prompt and I want you to pray. I'm going to pray with you, but I want you to pray. But we're going to take some time on this. The, the beginning of the Lord's Prayer. You don't have to look at the screen. Most of you know it. It says, Our Father who's in heaven, hallowed be Your name. Lord, we want to stop for a moment and say thank You for being our Father. Thank You that You love us. Thank You that You have wrapped Your arms around us, that we don't have to do anything to earn Your love. We are loved by You already. That Your Word tells us that while we were still sinners, Jesus came for us. So Lord, we don't earn Your love. You just give it to us because You love us. Lord, hallowed be Your name. You are pure. You are holy. There is no one like You. The angels are around Your throne right now singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the one who was and is and is to come. We say thank you, Jesus. We pray right now in this room, in our lives, Lord, let your kingdom come and let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, let your kingdom rule and reign in my life. Let it rule in our lives. Let it rule in this church. Lord, let Your will be done. That every step that we take as individuals, every step that we take as a church family, that we would walk in the path You've set in front of us. Lord, let it be on earth. Let it be in Columbia City. Let it be in my house as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name. Lord, I repent. Some of you need to be praying. I repent in Jesus' name of every demonic assignment that I have allowed to step into my life. Every sin that I have committed. Every door that I have opened. Every thought that I've had. Everything that I have participated in. Lord, all the way from, from even uh, thoughts of temptation to the act of sin. In any part of that process, God, I repent of every bit of it. I ask for Your forgiveness and I receive it because I know You freely give it. I thank You, Jesus. I pray right now, Lord, that You would give me, give us our daily bread. Every bit of provision that we need. Lord, I pray that we would stop striving and start trusting. That we would understand that You are our provider. That we can work ourselves to death and not accomplish anything. But if we just rest in You, we can do what it says in Psalm 23. We know that You lead us, You guide us, You take care of us, that even in the presence of our enemies, You'll set a table up for us to eat. So Lord, forgive us for trying to do things in our own strength and our own abilities. Lord, we've already asked for forgiveness, but we're going to do it again. Forgive us of our sins and our trespasses. The things that we've done that grieve Your heart. Now I'm going to do this. I'm not asking you to scream it out loud, but if you want deliverance today, today can be that day for you, but you're going to need to actually pray about it. If, if, for Specifically, for those of you, maybe some of the stuff I mentioned, the books you've been reading, the movies you've been watching, maybe something I didn't say, but as I was mentioning other stuff, stuff popped into your heart and your head. You're going to repent of it right now, and the Lord's going to give you freedom from it. So right now, in the name of Jesus, every movie I've watched... <laughs> got real quiet. We're all praying until we start repenting. Holy Spirit, I pray before I even take a step further, Lord, I'm praying you begin to make stuff jump in people's hearts right now. The stuff, the garbage that we've allowed in our lives. Lord, any, any tendency sexually, whether it be homosexual, whether it be uh, uh, fornication, whether it be pornography, whatever it is, God, any sort of sexual immorality that is apart from the Word of God that we should not partake in. Doors that we have opened in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, we repent. Movies we've watched, books we've read, music we've listened to, anything that we have allowed into our bodies, our minds, our spirits, we repent. I also pray right now, any of these demonic things that are coming out, you have no business or authority. You're not welcome to mess with other people in here either. When we say get out, we mean leave. And stay out. But Lord, we repent of all of it in Jesus' name. We ask for Your forgiveness. I want to pray as well, Lord, not only for Your forgiveness, but Lord, help us to forgive other people. 
Forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who've sinned against us. If there are people in this room who are here today that are holding on to bitterness and resentment and anger and frustration towards somebody else, whether it's in this church or it's not, it's in their home, it's at work, it's at school, wherever it might be, and however long those things might be sitting there, in Jesus' name, I pray that You would break us from that spirit of bitterness right now. You would break us free from that spirit of unforgiveness. We command you to leave now in the name of Jesus. There are some of you who are going to go and have to ask somebody to forgive you after church today. There are some of you that are going to have to be willing to forgive even though you don't want to after today. You don't want to hear it, but I'm going to tell you because that's biblical. Can you imagine if Jesus wouldn't forgive us of the stuff that we've done? And the Bible tells us in the Lord's Prayer... We need to remember this in 14 and 15. Matthew 6 says, If you forgive others their sins, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you don't forgive others of their sins, your Father's not going to forgive yours. So Lord, help us to forgive. Help us to forgive and truly forgive, not fake forgiveness. Not pacifying forgiveness where we say we forgive somebody, but we still walk around bound up. Real forgiveness. Lord, we ask for your help to forgive. And we say it even, I'm not asking you, I'm not going to say do it out loud, but in your heart. If you've got unforgiveness in your heart, you need to say it. You need to say, God, I forgive this person, these people, and I'm asking for your help to walk in that forgiveness. Because you have to walk in forgiveness. You can say you forgive somebody, but you've got to choose it. Sometimes it feels like on a daily basis. But God, I forgive that person, whoever it is. Say it. Not out loud if you don't want to. Lord, I forgive that person. Help me to walk in that forgiveness every day. It's quiet in here. Demons have got to go now in the name of Jesus. Get out now. Lord, lead us not into temptation. Lord, help us to be aware of the situations that we step into. Lord, help us to know the places to avoid. As we walk through this life in the whole armor of God, with truth and righteousness, with shoes of peace, the shield of faith, salvation and the sword of the Spirit. Lord, help us to walk through these places in victory and not in fear. I command a spirit of fear to leave God's people. Today's message is not about be afraid of the devil. It's walk in the victory of Jesus. Live in the victory of Christ. But we say right now, in the name of Jesus, Lord, that we would pay attention. You'd give us discernment to know what to do, when to do it, how to do it, where to go and where not to go. The people to be around and the people we need to step away from. Lord, give us wisdom. And as we face the various trials of life, because we all face them, Lord, I pray that You would cause us to keep our eyes on You, knowing that You are the shepherd of our lives and You will guide us. I pray a hedge of protection around me and my family in the name of Jesus. Some of y'all need to be praying that for you and your family right now. Too much... uh, uh, spectating, not enough participating right now. Come on, begin to pray. Lord, I thank You for my wife. If you got a spouse here, pray for them. you got kids, they may, may or not be here. I don't care. If you got a spouse, pray for them. you got kids, pray for them. you got grandkids, pray for them. If you live all by yourself, pray that God would, would, would work in the relationships that you do have in your life. Maybe it's friends you hang around with, a club or whatever you might be in. Pray for people in the church. Just pray. Lord, I pray for my wife. I I plead the blood of Jesus over her, over her health, over her her mind, over every part of her. I pray the same for my three children. I bless them in the name of Jesus. We say in Jesus' name over them, over this church family, that there is a hedge, a thorny hedge of protection all around this house of God, these people of God. I pray it over my family that any device of the evil one is thwarted, canceled, and removed in the name of Jesus. That we would have discernment to avoid conflict when it's not even necessary in the first place. Lord, lead us not into temptation, but we pray that You would deliver us from evil. Every temptation that knocks at the door of our hearts. Lord, because we have made You our habitation, because we love You, and You love us even more than we could ever imagine loving You. That You are our refuge. And You're our fortress. You protect us. You guard us. We declare Psalm 91 over Your people today. We say right now, 
over each of us. Ain't no better way to pray than to pray the Word of God. We pray right now in Jesus' name that He who dwells in the shadow or in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. We say to the Lord, You are my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. You will deliver us from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. You will cover us with your pinions, and under your wings we will find refuge. And your faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. We will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrows that fly by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at our side, ten thousand at our right hand, but it will not come near us in the name of Jesus. We will only look with our eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because we have made the Lord our dwelling place, the Most High who is our refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall us and no plague come near our tent. For you will command your angels, God, concerning us to guard us in all our ways. And on their hands they will bear us up lest we even strike our feet against a stone. We will be able to walk on the lion and the serpent, the young lion and the we will be able to trample underfoot. Because we hold fast to love for you, God, you will deliver us. You will protect us because we know your name. And when we call to you, you will answer us. And you'll be with us in our times of trouble. You'll rescue us and you will honor us. And God, with a long life, we know that you will satisfy us and show us your salvation. And with that, Lord, we say this, for yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power, and yours is the glory forever and ever. Amen and amen. Listen, I want to tell you something today. What we just did is we prayed through the Bible. Some of you, that might be a foreign concept. Hopefully it's not. The Bible is full of prayer. Any passage that you can read, you can turn into some form of prayer. The best, in my opinion, the best way to pray is to pray through Scripture. You're walking through a hard time, find a passage of Scripture that supports what God's Word has to say about it, and then pray into it. But I want to say this one more time. If everybody could stand, I'm getting ready to dismiss the whole service right now. I'm getting ready to dismiss this whole thing. I just say in Jesus' name, every promise that's been given from God, every bit of freedom that's been given from the power of in the name and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we receive it now. In your own life, can you just say, I receive that freedom. I receive it in Jesus' name. And Lord, may we walk in that freedom. May we be, as Your Word says, that He who the Son has set free is free indeed. Not just free for a minute, but I walk in that freedom. And when temptation tries to knock, we say, Lord, in Jesus' name, give us the discernment and the authority to keep those doors shut. Guard our eye gates, our ear gates, and our mouths. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. God bless you as you go today.